Afghanistan and that, in fact, terrorism was real. And that was something we saw very chillingly on a daily basis when we got there. In fact, the night before the inauguration, the day before the inauguration, I got a call from Rahm Emanuel, the incoming chief of staff, and he said, uh, call me from a hard line. And he said, uh, we, we have uh, been with Chertoff and the Homeland Security people all day uh, because there is a real concern about an active threat on the inauguration. Uh, there were four guys who had slipped in the country from Canada that they were looking for, and they were feared that they were headed for the inauguration. And he said, you've got to write a, a, a letter. Uh, uh, you've got to write, I'm sorry, remarks for the president briefly that uh, instructing the crowd to disperse in an orderly way, telling them, you know, where, where to look for guidance from uh, people who would shepherd them out and so on. And I met the president-elect in the speaker's office and handed him uh, this letter that he put in his pocket. And had there been an attack, the Secret Service would have tapped him on the shoulder. He would have given that speech. So we were, uh, we were aware during the campaign and on the eve of the, of the administration just how serious the threats were were and that we had to deal with them uh, seriously. Uh, so there was no change in, in, in policy or thinking relative to that. He did try and close down. Guantanamo was thwarted by Congress. He did ban enhanced ter- uh, interrogation techniques. A lot of the commitments that people associate with him from the campaign on that side of the equation also also were carried out. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm a joint degree MBA MPP student here. Uh, And so I just wanted to ask, one of the biggest uh, areas of liberal criticism of President Obama was his increased use of drone strikes. Yes, uh, this was mentioned. Yeah, Yeah, and so I just wanted to ask, you know, you're talking about political considerations and military decisions. I was just curious if you think part of the reasoning driving that increased use of drone strikes was because of the fear of, you know, political backlash if an American soldier was killed in action. And so and therefore he decided to use something a little bit safer in that regard by relying more on drone strikes. Even well, there's no question that the pre- protection, preservation of uh, American troops was a, a factor in the president's thinking on these issues. There also, you know, there, there were places where, where there were terrorists operating that were hard to reach and you could send planes in and bomb them, but the, but the uh, possibility of, you know, ancillary civilian casualties were greater uh, in that regard. So that was another consideration. So um, there, were, there were an array of considerations, but certainly protecting and preserving uh, our troops was one of them. I, I mean, I choose not to put it in a political context, and I never heard the discussion in that way. One more question? Yeah, we can do that. Do it. Uh, my name is Coco Yim. I'm a second year in Harris right now uh, doing master's in public policy. My question is, what are some of the things that you, you think the current administration is doing well in terms of, of uh, improving civ- uh, civil-military relationships? And if you don't think they're do- doing a good job, then what would you change? And like, how, what is your strategy of improving it? Thank you. Well, I don't think they're doing a very good job of it because I don't, you know, I think, a, a t- and look, I'm not, universally critical of President Trump. I, I actually think he, like every other president before him, uh, has pressured our NATO allies to do more in terms of the cost of their own defense. And he's had some success with that, and I give him credit for that. But the tip off, I mean, we, we heard some things in the campaign that betrayed attitudes that I think have infiltrated uh, his administration You know, as president. You know, one was when he said what he said about Senator McCain, that he didn't, you know, that he he didn't think of him as a hero. He liked people who weren't captured. That isn't, those aren't things that you want to hear from a, uh, from a commander in chief. And he referred to how he, my generals, and, and that was struck a awkward note. I think that, you know, if, 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 if there was a sense on the part of the Pentagon that President Obama was too deliberate, I, I think there must be a sense in the Pentagon of having to react to tweets, learning that you're, sent, you're, you're going to be asked to send troops to the border 
or that we're going to withdraw troops from Syria or any number of other things makes it very makes it for a very very difficult relationship and I, I don't think this president is very good at taking uh, advice I think one of the reasons why General Mattis left the Pentagon was because of that and that's worrisome to me in this television show that I do with with uh, Secretary Gates which will be on this weekend he said his big concern was that presidents need people around them who are going to tell them what they need to know and just not what they and not just what they want to hear I don't know that that is the case he he said he thought there were still people there doing that but we've seen a lot of people leave gen, uh, you know including the generals you know general kelly general mcmaster general mattis and i suspect part of it is that he wasn't good at hearing and taking advice and and a little too um loose at uh, announcing policy decisions without conferring with the people who are going to have to implement them so i have great concerns about this and I don't know if he has the capacity to correct it, but this and this may be why you know we still have an acting Secretary of Defense. I don't know he may have trouble recruiting people for some of these positions, but we'll see. As an American, I hope that this improves. I think it's important for this country. It's important for the world, but people are who they are, so we'll see. On that happy note, we'll uh, <laughs> wrap up. Um, David, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really, really enjoyed being appreciate here. it. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for joining us today on Thank You for Your Service. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at TYFYS underscore podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll get our next episode as soon as it's released. Thank You for Your Service is produced by Haz Yano, Ashwarya Kumar, and Mary Martha McClay. Special thanks to Admiral Mike Mullen, Captain Mike Robinson, Samantha Neal, and the Institute of Politics. This podcast is a production of the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast and is in no way intended to reflect the official positions of the Department of Defense or any other military entity. I'm Thomas Krasnation. And I'm Nick Pereso. See you next time. Chicago. The Windy City, the city of broad shoulders, the second city is complicated. Known for its legacies of segregation and political corruption, Chicago has a lot to grapple with. On Chicagoland, we bring you conversations with activists, journalists, politicians, and others who are working to address these issues. You can find Chicagoland wherever you listen to podcasts. From University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts, this is Chicagoland.